Okay, so um, I'm going to introduce myself. <laughs> uh, so I'm Dr. Christy Duran. I grew up here in the San Luis Valley. I grew up in Antonito, so just 30 miles south of here. And um, after I graduated from high school, I went off to do my degree at uh, the University of New Mexico, um, and then on to where I studied biology, then on to uh, CSU, uh, Colorado State University, where I studied neurobiology, and then uh, I went to CU for my PhD where I studied evolutionary biology, and now I'm a plant biologist. <laughs> I, I call myself a backdoor botanist. That's kind of, I uh, came in because uh, my doctoral thesis was on dwarf mistletoe, and I got really excited about dwarf mistletoe, and so decided that I wanted to learn everything about it, so I had to become a plant biologist. And I was fortunate enough, um, after some time at Colorado Mesa University, uh, to get hired here at Adams State University, so coming home um, after many years. So I'm going to talk to you about a topic that, that I've been interested in. Um, again, this is really an interest, a peripheral interest. It's nothing that I've really been trained in, um, but it's something that I've started to look more into. And so I wanted to share some of the things I've found with you. Um, and I wanted to start, if it'll advance my slide. <coughs> there we go. <laughs> um, a story of, of Champa. So this is a known as rose hips, right? So where I grew up, uh, we call it Champe. Not exactly sure where that name comes from. Um, I know that the flower we call Rosa Castilla, and uh, we always, would in, the, in the fall, um, would go out and uh, pick Champe. It was always, I'd go with my mother and my grandmother, and we'd pick it, and of course, it was then <coughs> bring it back, and we'd have to clean it, um, and then uh, make the jelly. So it was a really very, a laborious process, but it was something I always looked forward to in the fall. We were always looking for um, champa bushes, and it was the only place I'd ever really heard of it. When I'd gone to other places, no one had ever heard of, of champa or champa jelly. And then when I was a uh, graduate student, I had the opportunity to go to Argentina. And in Argentina, I, uh, I was tra helping train some students in uh, DNA techniques. But I discovered that they use this for everything. And they call in Argentina, it was called Rosa Mosqueta. And they made the jelly. I could get it at the stores. Um, they also had Rosa Mosqueta ice cream. So you can go and you'd get the ice cream. It was really very good. They even had Rosa Mosqueta wine. Um, and so I remember bringing some back to my, my parents. Like, look, I found Champa wine. I tried to make it once, and it didn't work out. <laughs> so. Um, but this is always really very fond memories of time I spent with my, my grandmother um, and my mom, and we would just spend um, hours out collecting and then making this delicious jelly that was like gold because it was so much work to just get a little, a little jar. Uh, and I have some today um, that my mom made, so if, you're, well, if you haven't tasted it yet, you're welcome to get some before you leave. So um, another thing growing up here, you know, uh, pinon, lots of pinon, um, and I remember, this is one I never actually went out and collected, but my grandfather, he did enough collecting for all of us, so we never really had to go. <laughs> and he was very generous, he'd give us uh, lots of pinon, but as, as you know, it's, it's also, if you've ever picked it, it's labor intensive, mm -hmm. and again, you guard it, it's like gold, right? Um, I also have some pinon that I didn't pick myself, but um, paid a pretty penny for it in New Mexico. Okay, so this, this is kind of my very early experiences with, um, with plants. And before I even was really realized I was interested in plants, like I said, it came in the back door. It wasn't until I was in my 30s that I became really interested in plants. Um, that I was, was introduced to this term called ethnobotany. Um, so what is ethnobotany? Well, this was a term that was first coined um, in 18. 95 um, by Hashberger, and so he defined it as the study of plants used by primitive and aboriginal people. I think a more uh, accurate or better definition of ethnobotany is basically the study of the interactions between people and plants, um, and so not just how we use plants, but how uh, it influences our culture uh, and influences a lot of um, of what we do. And so 
the, the study of plants, the use of plants goes back eons, right? Um, basically co-evolved with plants. Some of the very earliest documentations of uses of plants um, was in Babylonian me uh, medicine. So here is old text uh, about almost 2,000 years uh, BC. So very old uh, text. And this was translated um, having lots of different uh, uses, and this was, was one that, that was associated with this. Um, if a youth's testicles are inflamed, you mix together equal quantities of powdered roast barley um, and powdered, and then they can't read the rest. Um, if it is summer, you knead it in kasu juice. If it is winter, in hot water. Um, and so it has not only what the use is for, but also how to, to do this. Um, also, along with Babylonian medicine, it was often found this symbol talking about um, medicine. It was these intertwined um, serpents. And uh, this goes back about um, 2000 uh, BC. And so um, it's always depicted with this um, kind of this twin staff. So these, these two um, things that really had to do with medicine. And as you see that that looks familiar, um, it's kind of what we use sort of for the, the medicinal symbol for medicine um, nowadays. Um, you can kind of go through and see other very famous works throughout history. Uh, Gerard's Herbal, um, this was about uh, 19, uh, 1500s. And so here's an excerpt from, from this for Foxglove, something that's found to be used quite a bit. Uh, I don't know what uh, naughty humors is, but <laughs> slimy phlegm. Yeah, okay. Um, What's well, interesting, this is, you can still find this text. And so uh, Gerard's herbal has evolved. Um, here's a, a modern version, and even more modern, you can get the um, CD-ROM of the uh, Gerard's herbal. And then, of course, not only with uh, medicines, but also uh, religion. And so um, the fig tree, uh, the bow tree, the ficus, um, uh, it, even its scientific name, see, has the term uh, religion, like religious, um, in it. And that's because um, uh, Buddha, the person who came to be uh, revered as Buddha, is said to have gained enlightenment uh, while sitting beneath um, this particular tree. And s it's got these very characteristic, almost heart-shaped heart um, leaves. So this is a very revered tree um, for uh, Buddhism. Um, other early uh, documentations, um, Hildegard of um, Bingen, she, she did a lot of um, herbal, she was an herbalist, and she put a lot of um, her work uh, also down on, um, on paper, so written word. Okay, so um, why are plants so important? Well, we know we get a lot of our food from plants. Um, I have a picture of this guy. He was one of the first ones to try to figure out why what makes plants grow? He did a, a fun experiment thinking that it was soil. It was, it was, taking, up, it was taking up soil and that that must be where this biomass was coming from because you've got your plant, it grows. Um, however, found that there's no difference in the amount of soil. You have this plant that gets all this biomass. Um, what he didn't realize is that plants are getting their biomass out of thin air, really. So they're taking carbon dioxide the carbon out of the car uh, carbon dioxide from air, and they're fixing it um, into biomass. And so that is uh, where we get um, our food from, really. And it's basically the primary producers for um, all, all animals. And so plants have got, of course, this um, energy for food. Uh, we've used a lot of plants for food, and I'll be talking about some of those. But also, they've got chemicals uh, that we use for medicines. Um, and the reason that they have these chemicals is because things eat them. And so when you get eaten and you can't run away like a plant, um, then you have to find a way to defend yourself. And so they defend themselves by producing these chemicals, um, often called secondary uh, compounds, that are going to uh, deter predators, uh, would be uh, herbivores. And a lot of times those chemicals um, happen to have uh, some sort of a medicinal property or property that we can, we can use. Okay. Um, and so you might ask, 
you know, what, what is this plant good for? What is this plant good for? You guys have probably heard of this one, echinacea. Yeah, it's supposed to be good for, for immune system, right? So um, perhaps medicine, so this you can get these in, in extracts. Um, some of the studies have been really very actual scientific studies where they do double blind, um, you know, looking at making sure that what double blind means is that the person getting the treatment doesn't know whether it's a placebo or not, and the person giving the treatment and taking the measurements also doesn't know what they got. So it's, it's double blind. And those studies haven't been very convincing as far as whether or not they have um, uh, effects on the immune system. So that one um, verdict is still out, it, it appears to be. Um, so when we consider what a plant is good for, leads to other types of questions. So where does the plant normally occur? Um, how is the plant cultivated? Can we combine natural occurrences and cultivation um, in mutually beneficial system? So one of the things that, that we've seen with some medicines that's interesting is that, or some herbal supplements, is that by themselves, they don't really, they might not do what they're supposed to do or what it's um, thought that they do, but often they can enhance the effects of other drugs. Um, and so we see that with some uh, chemotherapy drugs. You can see that some uh, plants can actually enhance the effects um, of the uh, chemotherapy. However, when they're by themselves, um, they don't really have an effect. They can enhance some of the, uh, the drugs. Um, also, where things are grown and how things are harvested are also really very important. Um, so, for example, when we're talking about um, uh, osha, so you've got, and I'll show osha in a little bit, um, it's one where you use the roots, um, and it has pretty potent medicinal properties. Now those, it's just really only potent when you harvest them in the fall, um, and that's because um, it's going, getting ready for winter, so it goes dormant, and it's going to take all of the valuable compounds that it has in the leaves and store them down in the roots, because these things are kind of expensive, so it's hard to make them every year, so you uh, store them. So in the fall, it's when all the storing is taking place, and then that's when these roots would have more of their, um, of their compounds. There's also been some other plants that um, I've been documented that they're really, you should only harvest these um, during a full moon at one o'clock in the morning, uh, which seems really odd and kind of hocusy pocusy. But some have shown that it's because the plant is doing something with those chemicals at that particular time, and that it really is a reason to harvest it at that particular time. So there's really some things to what these plants uh, do. Also, uh, of course, as I said, I, was, I studied uh, mistletoe, and so I came across this article I found uh, fairly interesting, was that the Christmas mistletoe um, has some anti-cancer properties, or they found that it seemed to have some anti-cancer properties. However, it only had these properties when it was uh, growing on a particular host versus a different species of host. Um, however, the host tree didn't have this particular chemical. Uh, the mistletoe did, but only when it was growing on a particular host tree. So the conditions um, are also really very important. Okay. Um, so the origin of medicine, um, there's lots of different kind of folklore on the origin of medicine. This is one that I found uh, was a, a Native American, and I, I think it was Hopi, I can't remember right now for sure, that the uh, animals were out to get the humans. Right? And so they were going to um, take down the humans because they were in the way. Uh, who can argue, I guess? <laughs> but the plants heard them concocting these, these schemes. And so the plants agreed that they would each um, have a different type of a poison um, a, or a chemical against the different um, animals that would harm the humans. And so that was where the origin of these medicines um, came from. So what, one of the stories, one that I like. Okay. So there really is a, an urgent need to study medicinal plants. Um, and so the World Health Organization um, gives various reasons. Um, one of the main ones is to rescue knowledge. Um, so a lot of the knowledge that um, 
that indigenous people hold about uh, plants and their uses um, is declining, um, and for, for various reasons. A um, lot of uh, kind of westernization, uh, use of, of more, um, what they call more modern medicines, um, and also um, a lot of indigenous people have been burned um, kind of in the past with sharing some of the knowledge. And so there are a good example is in Madagascar. Um, so in Madagascar, one of the uh, really important plants that, that's come in for medicinal uses is the rosy periwinkle. Um, it's the origin of uh, two very important drugs, vincristine and vinblastine. And these are drugs that treat um, childhood cancer and Hodgkin's disease, or childhood le leukemia and cancer disease. Sorry, Hodgkin's disease. Uh, the childhood leukemia, it has about a 90% um, success rate. Um, this, I think it's been Christine. Um, and the other one has a very high success rate for um, Hodgkin's disease. You imagine these are very, you know, multi-million dollar drugs. Madagascar is really very, very poor. Does not see a dime from any of these um, of, uh, royalties from the native plant that's native in Madagascar. So you can imagine how some people are reluctant to share some of these um, ideas. So working on these treaties, ways to find uh, that make sure that some of the income from discovery of really important medicines goes back to the country of origin. Um, I think I have other numbers here. So the World Health Organization found that 20,000 plant species um, are used for medicines in 90 uh, different countries. Only 250 of those 2,000 species um, have really been analyzed for uh, chemical analysis and to see um, if, if they have uh, chemicals that really we can use um, uh, for uh, medicines. So, so those are, that's really very important. Uh, another reason is the utility of plants in current therapy. So some plants, some of the chemicals from these plants are being extracted and used, and they're trying to synthesize chemicals that are similar and have, of course, the, the hopefully the same action, but finding that the plants, the chemicals from the, the plants are more effective um, than some of these synthetic chemicals, and so that's um, um, also important. Also finding new molecular models in plants. So finding other plants that might have uh, chemicals that have important medicinal uses that we have not yet discovered. Um, whoops. Um, and finally, it has a very wide use of plants in folk medicine. And the World Health Organization really encourages uh, places in developing countries that really can't afford um, expensive Western medicine to continue to use folk medicine because they often uh, really have their uses. So they, they are not just, um, they don't really do anything, uh, but they really are an important source of medicines for people who can't afford um, like Western medicine. So they really encourage people in, in various areas to continue to use um, folk medicine because it's in some case the only type of medicine that they have and it's also very useful. Okay, so that's sort of the, uh, the background um, about ethnobotany. Uh, when I came here, I came across this article uh, that was in the 80s. And so this was um, looking at the ethnobotany of the San Luis Valley. So ethnobotanical notes from the Valley of San Luis, Colorado. Um, so Robert Bai and um, Aldemira Linares were from uh, the University of Colorado. And then um, Hadin Botanico from uh, Mexico came and did an inventory. And, and actually I talked to Dr. Dixon and you met with them and got to go out with them, uh, which, which I would have loved to do. I thought it was really very interesting. So what they did is they surveyed, they did a survey of a lot of the plants that people in the San Luis Valley use. Um, and they also went to a, a place that was termed La Botica. And so uh, La Botica turns out to be um, just uh, west of um, La Jara. And um, here it's very difficult to get to. Uh, never, never been there, but the 
uh, theory, they think that Native Americans might actually have planted, have brought in seeds and, and planted um, the most medicinal use, useful plants in this particular area because never have they encountered such a high concentration of medicinal plants in a single area. Um, and so La Botica um, really means like the pharmacy. Um, and so this, this area has a lot, a, a lot of uh, uh, medicinal plants. And I'm not sure if anyone has been there um, really very recently. So, um, what it, oops. Whoa. So what I thought I'd do is go through some of these plants uh, that um, are used. I'm going to go through some of these maybe kind of fairly quickly. I'm not going to go too far on their, their uses. Um, for more information on, on some of these uses, uh, there's a great book that I'd recommend. It's called Los Remedios. Um, it's by Michael Moore, and it's Traditional Herbal Remedies of the Southwest. And so this is a lot of the, uh, the plants that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, I also have a copy of the article, the Bilinaris article, that goes through all of these plants and talks about um, what they're used for. So a lot of you here have probably heard of Immortal. Um, so I have the, the uh, Spanish name there and then the species. So this is um, milkweed. Um, milkweed has been used for lots of different things. So Immortal has been used for um, common colds, uh, usually for bronchitis uh, prepared with teas. Uh, the sap uh, can be used for chewing gum. Um, it's also been used as a topical remedy for warts, uh, ringworm, and moles. Uh, some Native Americans used um, milkweed as a contraceptive. Not sure how well that works. Um, it was also a, a folk remedy for cancer. Um, I haven't seen any research. What I'm trying to do, what I've tried to do, is go through some of these and see if they've been scientifically researched. And I didn't come across any for this. Um, in World War II, uh, children were encouraged to collect the, the pods and to use the, uh, uh, the down um, to kind of stuff jackets to keep them warm. And so here's what that down um, looks like. And so you can use them to stuff, um, like I said, jackets, keep warm. And also I found there's a company that makes uh, comforters, um, the Ogallala Comfort Company that makes comforters using um, the seeds from the inside. They cost a pretty penny. So I think it was about $1,000 for a comforter. <laughs> I can imagine that's an awful lot of milkweed. Yeah. Okay. Um, another really common one, this is one that I, I've never collected. Um, no, actually, that's true, not true. I have collected it. Um, but Osha, and this is one that we've used uh, quite a bit. Um, and so the root is often uh, collected also in the fall, as I mentioned before. And um, lots of different uses uh, really to uh, ward off um, evil for just one of them. <laughs> uh, that was a kind of a more of a folk use. But also to, um, as an antimicrobial, uh, um, also for uh, colds, um, for chest colds. This one is one that has been examined um, scientifically and found that it does indeed have both antibacterial and antimicrobial um, remedies or uses. Uh, what was interesting, the story about this, one of the uh, common names is also called bear root. It's bear root. And so when you think about really how did people determine whether or not uh, something had a medicinal property, right? um, other than the, the folklore story right, about the, the animals and the plants. A lot of it is by observing animals. Um, what, do the, what do animals do? How the animals know this is another story. But how what if humans have decided which plants might have medicinal uses by observing plant, uh, animals. And so what they found is that when bears uh, come out of hibernation, um, one of the first things that they do is they roll around in um, the uh, osha, uh, not the roots, of course, but the leaves. And they just roll around um, uh, observations. They're looking like really very frisky and such. Mm -hmm. Turns out the leaves also have antimicrobial activity. And so you imagine these bears have been in hibernation for several months, and so getting a lot of uh, fungi and bacteria on them. And so this is kind of a way of taking a bath. Mm -hmm. 
Um, <coughs> another one is uh, Plumajillo. Um, this is also known as yarrow. Um, the uh, scientific name is on top. This one's used for cold, stomach aches, um, also for, uh, to treat anemia. So this one, the scientific name Achillea, um, it gets the scientific name from Achilles. Um, so the, the myth is that uh, a centaur conveyed the herbal secrets to Achilles so he could use them in the battlefield to treat um, his men. So that's where that name came from. Um, oh, sorry, back up a little bit. This one also has confirmed uses. So this one has been studied scientifically and found that it has analgesic um, as well as anti-inflammatory properties. It does have clotting properties, uh, anti-clotting properties, uh, sorry, clotting properties. Um, so it would be useful in the battlefield, right? Um, it also stimulates blood flow to the pelvic area and to the uterus. So Artemisia uh, frigida, um, also known as Altamisia de la Sierra or um, Estafiate. And so this one was used to, uh, for stomach aches and rheumatism. This one also has been studied scientifically and found that it does have antimicrobial activity. Um, a different species of this also um, helps with inflammation and it is, is useful to treat um, rheumatism. Um, Manzanilla, uh, this has been used for um, colic, um, diarrhea, um, used, used in a tea. Uh, this is not one that I've come across scientific studies about. Chamisa Hediondo. Uh, this one I've had to drink before. Has anyone ever had to drink Chamisa Hediondo? It tastes absolutely horrible. Um, so it's a tea made out of uh, sage, sagebrush. And it's uh, said to treat colds. Um, I know we always have some in the refrigerator because it's also supposed to help with stabilizing blood sugars. Um, and my mom is a diabetic, and so she used to make the chamisu so heavy on dough. And we used to drink it when we had colds. And so it, it tastes horrible. It really induces this gag-like reflex. <laughs> and I remember um, when I was in, in college and, and even at, at, at Mesa, and we used to go hiking where there was a lot of sagebrush, and everyone says, oh, doesn't that sm sage smell great? I just thought of being a kid and <laughs> <laughs> it took me a while to appreciate sage again. So yeah, so Chamiso Hediondo um, also has confirmed antibacterial properties um, against things like E. coli, um, different types of staph, um, also against yeasts, um, so an antifungal. Um, it's also useful for treating uh, dermat uh, dermatophytes. So um, things that affect the skin. Um, they also have found that this one was interesting. So Artemisia, um, a different species than this one, found that when given to mice, it decreases hyperglycemia. Hyperglycemia. So it does have some kind of um, blood, uh, di uh, blood sugar regulation. My mom would argue. She said it never worked. <laughs> Um, so another one is Anil del Muerto. Um, this one is used to treat colds um, arthri and arthritis, often as a tea um, or in a bath. And this is one I, I hadn't found any scientific studies on. Um, Nopal, um, this is one that's used for food um, and also uh, is said to uh, lower blood sugar. Um, again, I think that there has been some studies, um, contradictory studies, so I think the verdict is still out as whether or not this does um, lower or stabilize blood sugar. Um, the juniper species, so uh, Savina, uh, matcha or Savino. Um, this is used for to treat kidneys, uh, painful urination, um, or rheumatism. And I couldn't find any scientific studies that, that had examined this. Um, alfalfa, uh, Medicago sativa, um, is used to treat uh, fragile bones. Um, um, and also arthritis. Now, haven't seen studies with um, alfalfa, but the fragile bones might be related to um, what we find in equisetum. And so this is um, horse tails. And so this one is used for urinary tract infections as an anti-inflammatory. Um, 
eczema, ulcers. But they've also found that it does help increase bone strength. And the reason it can in <coughs> increase bone strength is because it has silica in the cell walls, which alfalfa also has some silica in the cell walls, not as much as the um, horse tails. Um, and what they found that it does is it increases bone density um, by drinking it as, as a tea, that the um, silica can prevent the chelation of the calcium. The calcium doesn't leave, so you have more of the uh, uh, bone density, a higher bone density. And so this has been uh, uh, shown uh, scientifically. Um, here's one that's used for food, um, garambuyo. Um, so the fruits are eaten here. Um, so yerba buena, poleo, menta. So this is all um, mint. Um, these are used for stomach um, or colic, um, also as an eye wash. And we've got something else in the same family here, um, oregano, uh, which is also used for um, stomachs, uh, stomach aches as well as, um, as a spice. Um, malvas, uh, these are used, to, was used to treat sore throats, um, mumps, and mumps. Um, again, I didn't see any studies that have been done on malvas. Um, something in the same family um, is the uh, yerba de, de la negrita. Um, this one was used to remove boils, um, supposed to prevent hair loss. Uh, again, this one hadn't been studied. Um, and then another one is uh, Yerba de San Juan, not in the same family, uh, but this one oh, has been used to treat infections. Um, and I hadn't come across any studies that had looked at um, whether, they, whether or not they do have antibacterial or antimicrobial properties. Um, so spruce, uh, Pinot Real, um, this one is also used with uh, Yerba de Negrita to treat urinary tract infections. So they were uh, boiled together as a tea. Um, and then, of course, uh, pignon, um, which we use uh, to eat. And there are some really great nutrition facts about uh, pignon. So, 100 grams of, of uh, pignon has about 31 grams of protein. It has the highest amount of protein of any of the other seeds um, out there. Um, it's also one of the best things about them is it's got a high concentration of monosaturated fats um, and that helps pave the way for a healthier cardiovascular system. Um, it has a lot of vitamin D. I think it has more than any of the other nuts as well. Uh, and that leads to stronger bones and teeth. Um, it has high vitamin A and vitamin C to boost the immune system. Um, it also has uh, other minerals such as phosphorus, potassium, um, that also help uh, uh, with overall health. Um, it's a good source of thiamine, um, so one of the B vitamins. It's also one of the highest. Um, so it's got, let's see, 1.8 to 2.8 milligrams, whereas in animal organs, which usually have high thiamine, have about 0.2 to 0.5. So it really has high amounts of thiamine for energy. Um, it also has lectin, uh, which is supposed to chemically bind with cholesterol and help lower, lower cholesterol. So pignon is good for you, even though it's really labor intensive. And so I have, I have some pignon if you'd like to try some, especially after hearing that. Um, so uh, pinus edulis, uh, also the needles are used, are um, other parts of the plant, trementina. This is what this is called. So it's uh, mixed with honey uh, to treat hemorrhoids. Um, again, this was one that hadn't been, I couldn't find any studies on it. Uh, lengua de vaca. Um, this one is supposed to help teeth. So um, as a, as a uh, teeth to help pre uh, prevent tooth loss and also inflamed gums. And then, of course, um, uh, champa or rosa castilla, um, which is used to make uh, jam. Also, it has very high amounts of vitamin C. Um, it's really good. You also can see, you can buy vitamin C um, at the store, and then it says with rose hips. 
supposed to enhance the amount of, of, of uh, vitamin C. You can drink it as a tea. I forgot to mention when I was in Argentina, you can also buy the dried um, uh, berries and then it was infused um, as a tea. So pretty much everything was Rosa Mosqueta there. Um, face products, <coughs> endless amounts of face products with Rosa uh, Mosqueta. Um, Ortiga, um, all right. This one uh, was used to treat uh, venereal diseases um, or uh, difficulty <coughs> urinating. This one was one I hadn't um, seen uh, any studies uh, in that respect anyway. Um, when I taught, I, so I, I was interested in this, in this topic, and when I was teaching at uh, Colorado Mesa University, I was able to teach an ethnobotany class and I had my students pick a plant and then we tested different sort of um, attributes of that plant. And one of the things that we did was look at its uh, toxicity. And so we got brine shrimp and added some extracts of their, their plants to brine shrimp. And someone did uh, the stinging nettle. <laughs> and I'll never forget those, those brine shrimp. The effect on the brine shrimp was really strange. Um, they, we came back after a couple of days and they all kind of looked dead. They just were sort of floating. But you'd poke them and they'd move and then they would just float. So they were basically stunned. You know, something in the, the chemicals um, here was really very um, stinging for them. Um, lavender or alusima uh, is used to treat uh, uh, diarrhea, particularly in, in infants. Uh, maravilla. Um, is one used as a tea to treat against stomach ailments. Um, Verdolagas, you guys have probably all seen this, much personally, in growing uh, weeds in your, uh, in your lawn. Has anyone ever eaten them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're pretty good, so especially you cook them with, with onion. Um, they're also really very high in vitamin A. Um, Kelites are uh, wild edible er herbs. So this one is uh, so called lamb's quarters. Um, these are also high in vitamin, vitamin A, uh, often known as the wild spinach. Um, and then kota uh, tea. Um, you brought me some kota. We, I, get to, I had never had it before that. Um, and so it's supposed to be a, a blood uh, detoxifier uh, and blood purifier. And then, of course, we love our chili, right? Um, and so um, capsicum or capsaicin is the chemical that gives it the, the really hot taste. Um, and they found that it's got some really um, interesting analgesic properties, uh, really important for uh, rheumatism. And so um, they're really doing a lot of research uh, on capsaicin. Um, so in the, in the San Luis Valley, if you know anything about the San Luis Valley, which I'm sure you all do living here, um, it has a really very rich history, a uh, rich uh, historical, uh, cultural history. And so a lot of the um, medicinal plants or the plant uses often come from both um, a lot from Native American, but also some of the um, um, Hispanos who had come over from Spain and some of the uses. Um, some of the things that we see is like in the name of the, the plants. So like um, Osha, um, which is a... Um, Spanish name related to a plant in um, Spain that was used to ward off evil. And so that name was given to one of the medicinal plants. Um, and so that's one of the uses of Oshas to ward off evil. Um, also, it's supposed to ward off rattlesnakes. Has anybody heard that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my, my, uh, my grandmother said this. And when I went on a field trip as an undergrad, I was terrified of snakes. And we were spending 10 days in the desert. Um, <laughs> and of course, one of our goals was let's go see rattlesnakes, and I didn't want to. So I carried this Osha with me everywhere. And interestingly enough, they said it was the only year we didn't see a lot of rattlesnakes. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, you can draw your own conclusion. Um, so um, that's sort of the, uh, the, I picked the main plants in that article, and it's a lot of the ones that had. Um, some of the scientific studies, uh, some of the, uh, the backup, or at least had been studied that way. I wanted to talk, pick a few other plants that I found um, interesting when I taught ethnobotany, looking at, at people of uh, Chaco Canyon and uh, Mesa Verde. And so here's 
So the, in the four corners, um, here's Mesa Verde, if you're not familiar, and then uh, Chuckle Canyon. And so looking at um, the groups of people who lived here, and by doing a lot of archaeology, we were able to determine some of the plants that they used. Um, and so I chose a few of them here, and I found were interesting. Um, so Mariposa Lily, uh, these were often, the bulbs were um, dug up. Uh, they could either be eaten raw or baked. Um, the seeds were often ground up um, for meal. The flower buds could be eaten raw. Uh, the bulbs were popular with kids because they were kind of sweet tasting. Um, I have not had um, um, this. Has anyone ever, ever eaten this? I haven't either. This is one of my favorite plants only because of its uh, very poetic scientific name. Um, it's Sarcobatus vermiculatus, just roll off the tongue. Um, so this is greasewood. Um, this one is common around here. Uh, some of the uses uh, Native Americans used were for insect bites, diarrhea, uh, toothaches. Um, this plant was first described on the uh, Lewis and Clark expedition. Um, <laughs> this is four-winged salt brush. Um, so Native Americans used the seeds for cereal. Um, also used the leaves um, in uh, flour um, and ashes. So that they used the leaves, the flowers, the ashes, um, and they ground it, and they used it for leavening bread. And then plants weren't always used for just <coughs> their uses. They were also indicators of important things. Um, so this is needle and thread grass. And so Native Americans used this as an indicator of when to hunt for buffalo. Um, so when the seeds were out, it was time to hunt for buffalo. Mm -hmm. um, choke cherry, um, this is one I, I didn't include before, um, but this is one that is used in the San Luis Valley um, to make uh, jelly. I think it's copuline, um, is the choke cherry jelly. <coughs> um, so it was important in the diet of, of Native Americans in Chaco Canyon and Mesa Verde. Um, use the fruits to ground into a meal, uh, make three inch patties. I haven't ever tried it that way, but it would be interesting. Um, broom snakeweed. Uh, this one, the uses aren't really very clear. Native Americans may have used them. Um, it, it's really very general, but, but there was documentation that, that was used. Uh, but in World War II, uh, it was used to produce rubber. Uh, the, the yellow was used for dye, um, and the galls have been used for toothaches. However, just eating it by itself, it's highly toxic. So I wouldn't recommend you do that. Um, Mormon tea, so this is um, ephedra. There's lots of different species of ephedra um, worldwide. As a matter of fact, the ones, um, the China ephedra is where we get um, ephedrine from. Um, but the one in the Four Corners area um, was used to treat urinary tract infections, respiratory illnesses, colds, uh, and nasal decongestion. So the same type of thing like um, <coughs> you find in Sudafed. Um, this one was interesting. I found a lot of information about how cattails were used. Uh, it's one I've, I've never um, eaten. So apparently you've got the two different parts and the younger, the lower part um, is really tasty before it turns brown. Um, you can cook both the top and the bottom, um, and just like you'd cook corn on the cob, but you'd have to do it young uh, before they, they really turn very brown. Um, they often call them kitten tails at this stage. They're, they're young. Um, you can take the pollen. So here's an example of getting a, a bottle, getting all the, the uh, pollen out, uh, and you can make the flower very bright yellow, uh, or yellow bread or yellow pancakes, and the protein, the pollen is high in protein. Um, also the stock, it's got a lot of starch, so you tease the, the fibers apart, pound them um, in water, and the water becomes a, it's supposed to be soapy, don't know where ropey came from, but ropey and slippery. Um, so then let the starch settle out, pour out the water, and then you've got um, flour that's really pretty nutritious. Um, the shoots can be uh, eaten raw or cooked. Um, if they're eaten raw, they should be sterilized. 
on lots of other uses. So the, the leaves can be a weaving material for floats and rafts. Uh, the seeds make good uh, pillow stuffing. Uh, the fluff is good tinder. Um, dried cattails are an eff effective uh, insect repellent when you burn <coughs> them. Um, and then another one we see around here is the Rocky Mountain bee plant. Um, this one, uh, this, both the seeds and the greens were an important part of the diet. Uh, the leaves are high in both calcium as well as vitamin A. Um, Indian rice grass, this one was, was interesting. Um, the seeds can be parched using uh, charcoal or ash uh, and then roast the seeds to basically pop the shell and then you make a hot grain cer cereal um, out of that. Um, tansy mustard, um, the greens can be eaten, but the seeds can be made from mush. Um, they would use it to make cake dough, uh, Navajo people. Uh, Blazing Star, this is one we also have around here, but wasn't documented in that um, article about being used. Uh, but the seeds were gathered parched and then eaten in pinches. Um, so, kind of bringing it full circle, um, these were some of the things that I've, I've gathered for, from some uh, very limited research. I have an uncle, who, uh, a great uncle, who has done a lot of, and still is active in collecting a lot of um, herbs, and I haven't had a chance to sit down with him, but I'd like to kind of sit down and really get this all on record. Uh, another uncle of mine uh, had someone who has uh, videotaped himself talking about different herbs that he hasn't had a chance to look through, so he's um, uh, going to give that to me, so hopefully, as, as my hobby, some of my spare time, we'll be able to collect um, some of this. But um, really, what I find that we're losing is sort of our connection uh, with the earth, uh, connection with plants. Uh, when I went to a botany conference a few years ago, we found that people in the, students in the United States don't care anything about plants. Um, if you look at other places where plants, where they're much more in tune with plants, um, the kids are much more interested um, in botany and in plants. And so really, uh, we don't want to lose some of that um, connection um, with the earth, um, even though, and also some of the cultural connection that I feel we're, we're sort of losing. But um, that I have a picture of my, my grandmother um, and my mom. She'd probably kill me because of, of her hair in the, in, in the 80s. <laughs> but they, they, I think actually they might be making champa jelly. Um, we used to go out every year and have very fond memories. Um, and my grandmother, every time we'd go out, um, she would say, you know, don't, don't ever forget. You know, she said, we're on. Um, it's tradition. You know, this is, this is tradition. And so I'm trying to pass this tradition on to my son. This is my four-year-old. Um, he, I didn't get to go out picking champa this year, but he did a couple of times with his grandpa. And um, here we are cleaning champa and Woody's helping. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I'll take any questions.